This is Fox 8 Overtime, sponsored by the 2018 Nissan Titan, backed by America's best limited truck warranty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of many Fox 8 Overtimes. I'm Juan Kincaid. You know the cast of characters around me, Sean Vazan, Chris Hagan, Garland Gillen. Just four guys sitting around talking about That's sports, what we right? we do. It's the easy thing. <laughs> Right. This, we're, taking, we're, we're taking the curtain and we're opening it up a little. You see what happens in the Fox 8 Sports Department now it's out Not in plain view. Not <laughs> Not Not some of the stuff we can't put on here. All right, let's get you right to the big, big board. We've got a lot of topics to get to on the big board tonight, beginning with the LSU Tigers making a statement. How about the Breeze versus Bridgewater dynamic? Is the NFL preseason too long? And we'll debut our Fox 8 Big 8 Power Rankings. i got a lot to say about that. A lot to say about that. All right, we're going to begin, though, with those LSU Tigers. What a first game against eighth-ranked Miami. LSU's offense exploded. 33.3 lead early on behind quarterback Joe Burrow making his first collegiate start. So are we all on the Joe Burrow bandwagon? Well, look, I think that first game was absolutely huge. You know, even you just felt that football IQ that we all heard about leading up into this game, even his throwaways felt like the right football move you know what I'm saying and his actual arm talent I think there's going to come a game where he's going to have to win a game based on his arm he didn't have to against Miami so they kind of stay conservative in that second half but I thought it was an impressive debut his stats won't wow you but if you really watch that game especially look to me the play of the game was to check out into that run to Nick Brossett where he scored the 50-yard touchdown I just think his football IQ really showed up in that game it was a good thing to see I think, you know, one of the questions that Ed Ogeron took in the press conference before the Miami game was, did his decision to pick Burrow as a starting quarterback or did the starting quarterback decision come down to who would be best for the Tigers offense yeah. or who would be best to face Miami? I think it's a little bit of both because I think Burrow and his mobility and like Sean mentioned, his decision making, his poise went a long way. He wasn't going to force any throws. He wasn't going to panic. He said after the game, he knew what kind of defense he had. He wasn't going to um, give Miami any momentum and, and give them any turnovers. And so I think that did weigh into the decision a little bit. I think he knew what kind of guy he had in Burrow and what kind of leader and, and mature decision maker he had. And certainly against an aggressive defense like we saw with Miami, it paid dividends. Sean pointed to it, the audible call by uh, getting, getting into the uh, run play with Nick Brissett. Fantastic call. His numbers, 11 of 24 for 140. Not the most flashiest numbers, but he made no mistakes, yeah. no turnovers. And that's, that, that's all that really matters when you're a quarterback there. Do not make the stupid turnovers. And I'll tell you one thing. I'm sure some of y'all saw this before the game, a little brouhaha on yeah. the field. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Joe Burrow was right in the middle <laughs> of, of that little – it wasn't a fist to cost, but there's yeah. a lot of talk a and a lot of, of jabber on. And he got right in there, and then I looked at the end of the first quarter, uh, a defender got in his face, and Joe Burrow got yeah. right back in. You love that kind of intensity. See, I, he had me. When I, when I saw your video from the pre pregame scuffle, whatever it was, he was right at the front, kind of clapping his hands a little bit. I'm like, okay, that team is ready to play for him. Joe Burrow really just won his team over right there. And look, from a physical standpoint, his best throw was that dig route, that 15 mm -hmm. yeah. and across. He had the big drop. Derek Dar Dillon had the big drop on that route. But that's a route, that's a throw. You have to have some timing. You have to have some patience. And a lot of quarterbacks in college football don't have that. He has that sense of timing, so maybe they want to run a timing offense. That's why he won that job, and that's why he's quarterback right At now. At the LSU. end of the day, doesn't this all just come down to LSU fans are happy to see something different? Think about what mm -hmm. Matt Cannon was with this team as the offensive coordinator for the very short time. When offensive lines would switch <laughs> all the way around, the fans would go, oh, my gosh, this yeah. is new. Well, now they've got a quarterback that can complete some passes and not make mistakes and actually check off of, 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 of a play and get into the right play. I think at the end of the day, whether it be Joe Burrow or Miles Brennan, or whoever the quarterback was going to be, it was about somebody being competent out there for once that can kind of get the job done. And you're not sitting there having to play defense for 60 minutes hoping that you can get 14 points on the board and stop trying to hold the other team. I didn't see that in this LSU team. The defense is going to be there, but you need a competent quarterback to help an offense along that we knew absolutely nothing about going into the first game. And I think it's certainly a good start. I don't want to go too far in on, on mm -hmm. overanalyzing one game. I will say, yeah. in terms of play calling, I do like the game that offensive coordinator Steve Insminger called, but I will say, I think at some point they're going to have to take the reins off, off of, or take the leash off of Burrow a little bit. They're going to have to let him get out there and maybe make a couple more plays. Some of those third and three, third and four situations, yeah. I wouldn't mind seeing them, you know, go for a quick slant.
slant or, or trust their receivers or trust Burrow a little bit more. But I think that's coming. Like like we said, you know, not making mistakes was key against I, Miami. I think one of the things we don't want to lose sight of here is the fact that they had a running game that we didn't know what they would have this year. First time in a long time. You got Nick Brosset, a very little youth senior in his career at LSU. 125 yards, two touchdowns, bell cow back. And I don't think we would have ever thought about using those words and associating those words with Nick Brissett, but he showed that he's a talented running back if given the opportunity. Well, and you said it, 125 yards rushing. Guess how many yards he had last season as a whole, <laughs> whole season, 96 yards. Yeah. That is amazing that, that he got all that, he got past that in one game. In high school, he had 141 rushing touchdowns. This guy was used to being the man. That's a state record, by the way, high school uh, rushing touchdowns. He's always been the man, the weight behind other players yeah. like Darius Geis, Leonard Fournette, that says a lot about, about his character that he would wait. Because, no, a lot of people don't want to wait. They're going to transfer right away. Ed Ogeron pointed that out about, you know, there have been guys in this program that have waited their turn, mm -hmm. Deion Jones, I mean, other guys like that. It's Riley. paid off for them, and, and you're reaping the benefits. A couple things I noticed. A, I love his running style. Very patient, no wasted motion, got good vision. Look at the way he breaks away right there. He's, he's a taller running back. Kind of reminds me of our guy, Deuce McAllister, a little bit. Maybe not quite the breakaway speed that Deuce, Deuce had in college, but still, and the other thing, look at the way he's holding that ball. It is right up here. Remember that fumble against Troy yes. last year? He remembers He it ain't too. fumbling again. Look at that high and tight. I mean, the ball's not moving. So I thought Brosette made a statement. And you know what? I like stories like this. He waited his turn. He's overcome a ton of adversity. So good for him, and I think that's the one area we were going into the season like okay who's going to be the running back I think he answered that question the big non-issue with this football team we all knew it was going to be the defense you knew that that side of the ball was going to play well and they did four sacks two interceptions on the Miami team look Miami's not a world beating team they were the eighth ranked team in the country and we expected more from them but this LSU defense gave us exactly what we expected yeah the first thing they did they took away the run obviously and, and that's a big part of stopping any offense they forced Malik Rozier into being the one guy that could beat him and as you know, we saw in that first half, he wasn't able to do that, even hurt them with that pick six by Jacob Phillips. And so um, that's what you wanted to see. That's what you knew this team was obviously capable of when they have that kind of talent on that side of the ball. They have experience. They have the talent. They have the leadership from guys like Devin White. And so I don't know what more you could ask from that defense, yeah. especially in the first half. Uh, you know, my, one of my game balls went to Dave Aranda. I thought he was one step ahead of Mark Rick in Miami's yeah. offense the entire game. It felt like every single blitz he called was perfectly timed, perfectly placed, perfectly executed. Even when he didn't get a sack, it just disrupted the play. I thought Dave Aranda called a masterful game. And look, I, look, Miami was a top 10 team. They sure didn't look like a top 10 yeah. team last night. And LSU had a lot a, to do with that. What, number 23? Well, they look like a team. Where, where do you have now, Garland? 11? I have them at number poll? 11. So is the AP Ooh, voters. Okay. So that, yeah, they jumped. They jumped 14 spots in the AP poll from the last week to 25 to 11. One other thing I like about the defense, it's got a little local guys in there. Yeah. Terrence Alexander, a graduate transfer, started. And then Christian Fulton, mm -hmm. out 18 months, mm -hmm. his first game. And there's a play right there I was going to allude to. Look at the defense. That led to a missed field goal, uh, Christian Fulton on the defense. That's amazing that you could go from not knowing you're even going to play this year yeah. to starting against Miami, a top 10 team. Uh, props to Christian Fulton. The one negative from this game we're finding out over the, after, after 24 hours later is that Caleb on Chason going to be out for mm -hmm. the year with a knee injury. We talk about players make the defense. I know the coach is great, but losing a player like that, that's tough. Look, they have some depth, but still, I, when I went to the spring game, it was not even close. I thought Chason was the best player on the field. You saw him last night. The guy was everywhere. I think, look, he knew it right there. I yes, think, he did. Honestly, Absolutely. I mean, I know he was waving off the, the, the card and the crutches yeah, and all that. Yeah. I think he knew right there. That is going to be tough to replace. They're going to be a great defense without him, but still, with him, you're talking about a top five, top three defense in NC2A. Yeah, this is where those numbers are going to be tested. This is where guys like an Andre Anthony or, or a Ray Thornton, guys that we've heard about for a couple of years but never really seen them too much, this is where they're going to have to be ready. And LSU and all these programs preach next man up. Yeah. I, I would say in Dave Aranda, you should trust. I think a guy like that will have his guys ready, but you That's see play. it on video. <laughs> you, you, you can't necessarily 
necessarily fill those shoes too easily. Uh, but LSU, I think they have the bodies. I think um, there are a couple different schemes they can cook up. There's other guys you can bring off the edge in ways that Dave Aranda can get creative. So I'm not going to bury this defense certainly just yet off of one guy, but it is a big loss. But, you know, when you look at the beginning of the year, people were already burying Ed Ogeron before the season even started, saying this is a must-win game for him. This is a must-win successful season for him to stick around. Might he bought himself a little more time? Did he save his job a little bit with this win against Miami? Oh, no doubt. Uh, they, they were out. The, the, the prognosticators were against LSU, barely put them in the uh, poll of 25. Three and a half point underdogs in this game. If they would have lost this game, Juan, it was six and six, mm -hmm. seven and five at the best. Right now, I mean, you, you're thinking this could be a nine and three, ten and two team. I know Auburn in two weeks is going to be a, a massive game on the schedule. But at least you get Southeastern this week. You can work in some of those defenders that are going to uh, fill in for Chasson. I just think that uh, this was a win that can go a long way. I saw a story today that the recruits, the seniors, love this. this yeah. is, it's all about recruiting, getting these guys in the future. But uh, Ed Ogeron <laughs> definitely bought us himself some time. I'm not going to put him at nine or ten wins <laughs> quite yet. I still think um, I, I still want to see more from this offense, especially in the red zone. I think against a team like Auburn in a couple of weeks, that's going to be huge. Yeah. We saw what they did to Washington. They absolutely own the Huskies in the red zone, and I think that's something LSU's going to have to overcome. So there's still questions they're going to have to answer, yeah. especially once you start facing some SEC defenses and some better offenses than, than Miami. Yeah. I'm going to save my take on this until <laughs> later in the show because I got a message for a few of the oh. Ogeron yeah. haters. Let's just put it down. All right, we'll save it for that. All right, looking ahead to week two of the college football schedule. The Tigers will be back at home to face Southeastern, as Garland just mentioned. La Tech welcomes Southern to town. Back in New Orleans, you got Tulane hosting Nichols. That'll be a fun one to watch. UL Lafayette will have the weekend off. Coming up on Fox 8 Overtime, Breeze or Bridgewater? Bridgewater or Breeze? When does the decision have to be made on which will be the Saints quarterback next season? We'll discuss that next. And later, is a billion dollars enough to convince the players to play more regular season games? Yep. Watching Fox 8 Overtime, sponsored by the 2018 Nissan Titan, backed by America's best limited truck warranty. Welcome back into Fox 8 Overtime. The great quarterback debate is coming to the Saints front office very, very soon. Breeze of Bridgewater, who you got next season. Did the Saints make the right decision on this one? He's a fantastic player in Bridgewater, but man, you got some question marks next year. Well, look, my theory on this, and, and we mentioned it in the, in the Black and Gold Review, uh, you got one more year this year as Teddy Bridgewater, the backup. I don't think it's a guarantee he's back in 2019 in New Orleans Saints uniform as a backup, because at that point, it would have been four seasons since he's played uh, as a starter. It all depends on what old number nine does after this season, because if he comes back next year and he's still playing at a high level, then I think Teddy Bridgewater possibly signs somewhere else. But if he retires, I think the seat is ready for old, uh, I guess it's Teddy Bridgewater number five, number five to, to, to step up and take over. Yeah. Of course, the easy solution that I think everybody wants to hear, Saints win a Super Bowl. Oh, Bridge right. 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 It's all good. Right. And then Bridgewater steps <laughs> in and it's all good. But no, I mean, if that doesn't happen, then like Sean mentioned, it does create a bit of an issue. I mean, the Saints would, I think, they made this trade hoping that there's a possibility Bridgewater is the future, but you're never going to turn away Breeze coming back if he's still playing at a high level. They have that team option, but uh, if Breeze comes back, then like Sean said, I think Bridgewater goes elsewhere. It only makes sense um, for Bridgewater to get back in the game because he's going to demand a high price. Yes. Yeah, it just breaks down to this. They win it all. Breeze walks off in the sunset. Bridgewater throw a lot of money at him. He stays in New Orleans. If Breeze comes back next year, Bridgewater's probably gone. And then it's Taysom time in 2020. That, that's two more years of seasoning Taysom of, of Taysom time. Hill. I, I think that's enough time. I think two years. 2020, put it on the, put it on the, uh, the, the uh, election. Breeze and uh, Taysom time. Taysom Hill will never be the starting quarterback oh, with the New Orleans Saints. come on. Juan. He will never oh, quarterback this hurt. team oh, no. on a full-time basis. And I, didn't, I like Teddy Bridgewater, but I don't think Teddy Bridgewater was the right quarterback to bring here because you have the question of having a guy with one year left on his contract, one guy with one year left to go on his contract, and you're stuck in limbo there. I mean, it's, we haven't even had a chance to hear what Breeze thinks about it. We know he's going to take the high road on it. But at the end of the day, he's saying, okay, this is the guy trying to take my job. 
if they win the Super Bowl, yeah, I agree with you. He probably does retire. But if they don't, you know he wants to come back and try to win again with this team. He's got a good team around him that could compete for the next couple of years. For the price of a third-round pick. No, he, I'm, 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 I'm not questioning that. If he ends up being a franchise quarterback, third-round yeah. pick is not, that's, that's no, pennies. No, I, I agree with that. The third-round pick, that's fantastic. I don't mind that. But I'm saying you're taking a huge chance as a guy that's probably going to want to go someplace else and get a long-term contract because Breeze is going to come back next year. But I think you have to take these chances to have the reward, the possibility of the reward on the other end. I think that's a worthy chance to take um, having Bridgewater for a year and maybe seeing him go for that third round pick than having to go look elsewhere or trade elsewhere or do something else to get your quarterback of the future and be left high and dry. I mean, we saw what happened with the Paxton Lynch. This is a guy that comes in mm -hmm. and he's ready to go. Yeah. yeah well, look, and look, this is the first time we can ever say since Drew Brees has been here since 2006, if Breeze goes down, the season is not necessarily over. Where every other year before that, if Breeze would have went down, that season would have been over. That's not the case right now. I agree with you, but I will end it with this. Taysom Hill will never be quarterback in this <laughs> team on a full-time basis. It is not the right quarterback for this system. And I don't know if Sean Payton wants to go through with that. All right, coming up, we keep it in the pros to debate the pros and cons of shortening the preseason and perhaps extending the regular season. Cash money, homie. Titan, backed by America's best limited truck warranty. All right, welcome back into Fox 8 Overtime. We want to get to our first viewer question of the brand new show. Submit it on the Final Play app using the Final Word feature. And the question is, with most of the team's positions filled already, why play four preseason games? Why not two or three games and make the other games count against the season? That's from Keith, Rocky Chauvin, and Homa Bayou Blue. Listen, Jerry Jones said just throw another billion dollars at them. They'll play. I like to think that money talks and players will walk out there and play for a little bit of extra cash. I, you know, I, I've been against this up until this year. This is the first year I've finally have started to come around on this, uh, this kind of line of thinking. With one sort of caveat, it's you got to expand roster sizes yeah. to at least 60 players for two more games. So if you do two more regular season games, two less preseason games, maybe one joint practice, I think that's enough. I think you'd be okay with that. I think the trend we've seen, though, is a lot of teams aren't even playing starters. Exactly. Especially with teams with not as much depth. When you look at the Rams, they didn't play Todd Gurley. Yeah. They didn't play Jared Goff. I don't think they need to. Todd Gurley said it himself. The dream is not to play in the preseason. <laughs> the players don't want to do it, and it's, it, it's a scary idea for coaches. I don't think you need four games anymore. I really don't. 18 game regular season. I'm all in on that. Drew Brees played one game uh, with so many mini camps, practices, OTAs, uh, training camp, uh, dual practices with other uh, teams. You got all the reps you need in there. Two games is enough. The owners, as long as they get those home games yes. and the away games and the preseason and the regular season, then they're fine. They're on board with this. I was going to say, that's the, that's the bottom line there. And the owner says, you know what? I'm playing these final two preseason games and fans are hardly showing up because our players aren't playing. I mean, guys, Drew Brees is not playing. People don't want to come see Taysom Hill play quarterback for four oh, quarters. Taysom, 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 Taysom Hill. Hill. I'm just saying. Oh. I'm just saying. <laughs> fans would rather pay for an extra regular season game, a game that counts, as opposed to a preseason game that guys are just trying to stay healthy in. That the man's the day. out there doing dirty work. He's on doing dirty teams. work. Dirty and you work. Sit in your and I love Taysom Hill. Him. Come on. Love Taysom Hill. Taysom train. Why? Come on. <laughs> Step All right, let's move on here in the high school football arena. A pair of public school powerhouses clash this week. We'll preview Edna Carr and Landry Walker and unveil our Fox 8 Big 8 Power Pole rankings for week two. That's next. Stay with us. Fox 8 Overtime, sponsored by the 2018 Nissan Titan, backed by America's best limited truck warranty. Our final segment here on Fox 8 Overtime, we reserved for our high school football, and we're using this show to unveil the newest Fox 8 Big 8 poll. Carr, Warren Easton, Curtis, and Destran are one through four. No surprises there. Five through eight, Terrebonne, St. Aug, Rummel, and De La Salle. And the number one team will be in action this week and our biggest game of the week with Carr taking on Landry Walker Garland. Uh, Edna Carr, back-to-back -back state champions. <coughs> it's going to be either Edna Carr or Warren Easton at the end of the season going for that 4A uh, championship. 
Friday night, Berman Stadium. Landry Walker got crushed by John Curtis, which is a really good team. Edna Carr escaped a tough game against St. Paul's. I think right now Edna Carr is the favorite in this game. Uh, great defense. Ronnie Jackson running the yeah. ball on offense there. I think Edna Carr right now uh, looks like a touchdown to win this game. They built a dynasty over there on the West Bank, and they had the best pregame. Oh, oh love, the best I love the sway, man. Bryce Brown is, is a fantastic coach doing big things on the West Bank. You're right. All right, time now for everyone's favorite, our final say. And Sean leads us off. Thank you, guys. To all the Coach O haters, Get em. simmer down. Regardless of what you think of him as head coach, the fact is this. Once again, despite a mountain of distractions surrounding the program leading up to the game, he had his team ready to play, and they dominated a top-10 team. In the 22 games he's been head coach of LSU, O is 16-6. and six. By the way, Nick Saban's first 22 games at LSU, oh, ready for this, 15 and 7. There yep. they go. That's right. <laughs> Through 22 games, Ogeron has actually had more success than Saban. No, I'm not calling him better than Saban. What I am saying is calm down, take a deep breath, because when you break it all down, Ogeron has actually done a pretty good job. He proved it Sunday, and who knows? Maybe he'll do it more times than you care to admit this season. Championships. <laughs> uh, Sorry. I think there's, there's smoke coming from oh, Sean. No, 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 no. <laughs> Look, uh, tonight. I'll bring you the final say on the U.S. Open. What? I'm talking tennis, <laughs> which is often underrated with the week one of the NFL season. The way it's shaping up, we could see a classic finals clash between Novak Djokovic and Rafael Nadal. You heard it here first. Don't <laughs> bail on the tournament just because Roger Federer lost and went out of this tournament early. This is still the golden era of tennis with three of the greatest all time still playing at a high level, Djokovic included. And if you saw Nadal and Djokovic face off, about two months ago at Wimbledon, you should be praying we get another classic between these former U.S. Open champions. Wow, I'm going after tennis. It's going to be tough. <laughs> now, for the ninth year in a no row, I'm participating in the AP College Football Poll. And now, again, this year, I had to deal with some issues in the preseason, some haters, maybe the guy next to me, <laughs> about what what I put in the preseason. Now, I will tell you this. It's hard to get reads when we don't get to see any practices. If the Saints get to see a ton of practices in the preseason college football, we don't. Yes, I missed on Texas and I missed on Florida State. They both laid an A. But I was right on LSU. I knew they had a strong defense. I picked them number 23 in my preseason poll. Uh, people on Twitter came at me. Juan Kincaid on the, on the right of me came at me. <laughs> and I hit on that one. Now, I'm not going to hit on all of them. But it, you, you, I like my batting percentage right now. I'm batting 333 uh, on the bottom end of my pole. Somebody tell this guy there's no I in team. <laughs> <laughs> All right, five years ago, I was fortunate to meet the best little golfer I'd ever seen. And five years later, baby James Grimes is still the best little golfer I've ever seen. The three-year-old is now an eight-year-old. And all he's done is win, win, win. No, no matter, matter what. what. Boom. To date, wow. baby James has won seven tour events and dozens of other smaller tournaments, most times against older competition. And get this, he doesn't even have a coach, just natural ability on the links. <laughs> all right, don't forget, game plan comes your way tomorrow night here on Fox 8 at 1035. Until then, for all the fellas next to me and everyone at Fox 8, thanks for watching. Our next newscast is at 4.30 a.m. Have a great night. This has been Fox 8 Overtime. Sponsored by the 2018 Nissan Titan, backed by America's best limited truck warranty.